waves, and light. In the 1600s, it was confirmed that light was a wave phenomenon because light forms interference patterns, among other things, and this is a property of waves, not of particles. Waves are the transmission of energy through a medium. They can either be a single wave, called a pulse, or a repeating wave. To understand the electronic structure of atoms, one must understand the nature of electromagnetic radiation. Repeating waves have a wavelength, the distance between corresponding points on adjacent waves. The symbol for the wavelength is the Greek letter lambda. They have an amplitude, the maximum displacement from the rest position. And they have a frequency, the number of crests that pass a specific point in a given time. The symbol for the frequency is the Greek letter nu. The wavelength and frequency are related to the speed of the wave. Speed equals frequency times wavelength. And for physical waves like water, amplitude and frequency are related to the energy the wave carries. Light is a repeating wave. It is a variation in the electromagnetic readings. Light waves do not have a variable amplitude like water waves, so the energy of the wave is related only to the frequency of the wave. The speed of light, given the symbol C, is a constant in a vacuum regardless of the frequency of the wave. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, and vice versa. So the speed of light, C, is equal to the wavelength of the light, lambda, times the frequency of the light, nu. The electromagnetic spectrum includes much more than visible light, as is shown here. Frequency and energy increase to the left. Most of the types of electromagnetic radiation are not detectable by the human eye. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, evidence developed that led scientists to conclude that light had a particle nature as well as a wave nature. This evidence was two problems in physics that the wave nature of light could not explain. Black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. Black body radiation. A black body is a theoretical object that absorbs 100% of the radiation that hits it. Therefore, it reflects no radiation and appears perfectly black. Black bodies, or objects similar to them, are actually fairly common. The filament in an ordinary light bulb is a black body. Iron, when heated in a fire, or in the element on your electric stove, is a black body. When a black body is heated, it emits radiation. A hot object emits radiation in a range of wavelengths of varying intensities. The radiation spectrum has a shape like that of the graph below with the peak wavelength directly related to the source temperature. The spectrum of light given off by a black body is dependent only on the temperature of the body, not on what the body is. The temperature of a heated object can be determined by its color. Note on the diagram below that as an object becomes hotter, the peak becomes higher, meaning more energy is emitted, and the wavelength of the peak becomes shorter and its energy increases. At around 500 degrees Celsius, there is enough emitted energy in the visible spectrum to be seen as a red glow, changing to yellow as the temperature increases. Classical physics suggests that as the wavelength decreases and the frequency of emitted light increases, the amount of energy released should also increase. This is the graph labeled rayleigh jeans Law. Notice that at higher frequencies and energies, the rayleigh jeans Law does not look at all like the actual black body spectrum. This lack of correspondence is called the ultraviolet catastrophe. This is a huge problem. 
In 1900, after several attempts to explain the spectrum of a black body, Max Planck proposed that light could only be emitted or absorbed in discrete packets that he called quanta. This is the quantum nature of light, and means that light has a particle nature as well as a wave nature. Based on this assumption, Planck was able to derive an equation that fit the emission of black body radiation. Even Planck at first thought that this was only a theoretical construct, but later came to believe that it was a fundamental aspect of the nature of light. The quanta came to be called photons and are the particles of light. The second problem in physics was the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect was first observed in 1887. It arose from experiments where light was shined on a metal plate that carried a static charge. If the charge plate were left alone, it would slowly lose its charge. When light was shined on a negatively charged plate, the charge disappeared rapidly. If light were shined on a positively charged plate, the charge would not disappear. In 1899, J.J. Thompson did experiments in which he used a setup similar to a cathode ray tube. He shined light on the charged metal plate, which caused electrons to be emitted. Essentially, he showed that the light caused the metal to emit electrons. In 1902, Lennard studied how the energy of the emitted photoelectrons varied with the intensity of the light and also with the frequency of the light. He found that there was a well-defined minimum frequency of light, below which no electrons were emitted, no matter how intense the light was. He also found that increasing the intensity of the light increased the number of electrons emitted, but did not change the energy of the electrons. This did not agree with the understanding of the energy of light at that time. This graph shows the results of an experiment similar to Lennard's conducted by Robert Millikan in 1916. It shows the energy of the ejected electrons as a function of the frequency of the light that was shined on the metal. Note two things. First, there is a minimum frequency below which no electrons were emitted. In this case, that frequency is 4.39 times 10 to the 14th hertz. The second thing to note is that the relationship between the frequency of the light and the energy of the emitted electrons is linear. It is as if each particular frequency of light has a specific amount of energy, and some of that energy is used to bring the electrons out of the metal. The electron then has the rest of the energy of the light. The fact that the intensity of the light had nothing to do with the energy of the emitted electrons suggests that each electron is receiving the energy of a particle of light with a specific energy. In 1905, Albert Einstein wrote his very first published paper explaining the photoelectric effect using Planck's ideas of quantization. He could explain the results by assuming that the incoming light radiation were quanta of energy h nu with nu the frequency. In photoemission, one such quantum is absorbed by each electron. This work predicted that as the frequency of the incident light increased, the energy of the emitted electrons would as well. This was confirmed by experiment. Thus, it was established that the energy of the photon was quantized, and light came to be viewed as both a wave phenomenon and a particle phenomenon, with the particle being the photon and the energy of the photon quantized according to the formula E equals H nu, where E is the energy of the photon, H is Planck's constant, which equals 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds, and nu is the frequency of light. Meanwhile, on the atomic structure front, Thomson had proposed his model of the atom, and Rutherford had done his experiments and discovered the nucleus. 
So we had an atom with a very small nucleus with most of the mass and all the positive charge, with the electrons taking up most of the space of the atom. The problem was that there seemed to be no reason for the electrons not to fall into the nucleus and for the atom to therefore collapse. Bohr's model. Now that we know about light, we can go on to the next model of the atom, Bohr's model. But first, we need to go back to the 1880s and talk about the hydrogen spectrum. Then we can discuss Bohr's model. The spectrum of hydrogen was discovered in the 1860s and early 70s. Initially, in the visible region of the spectrum, four lines were discovered. This spectrum was drawn with the energy increasing to the left. Eventually, other lines were discovered in the near ultraviolet region. The lines seemed to be getting closer and closer together until they reached a limit beyond which the lines stopped. In 1885, Johann Balmer, a Swiss mathematician, discovered that the wavelengths of the lines in the visible spectrum of hydrogen could be described by a simple formula involving only a single integer value. This was quite surprising at the time. Other parts of the hydrogen spectrum were discovered as well. One in the infrared region, the Pashen series, and one in the far ultraviolet region, the Lyman series. Both of these sets of lines could also be described by a formula similar to the one Balmer had found, but with a different set of integers. In fact, a single formula involving two integer values could be used to describe all of these lines. When converted into a formula calculating energy rather than wavelength, the formula becomes this, where n1 and n2 are integer values, n2 is greater than n1, and r is a constant called the Rydberg constant. In the Pashen series, n1 equals 3. For the Balmer series, n1 equals 2, and for the Lyman series, n1 equals 1. So the energies of the lines increase as the value of n1 decreases. In addition, the Lyman series represents the last series of lines in the hydrogen spectrum, the highest energy set of lines. There is a very large coincidence in the series, and that is that the energy for the limit of the Lyman series the highest energy line for the hydrogen spectrum is the same energy it takes to remove the electron from hydrogen. This leads to the suggestion that these lines in the spectrum are somehow related to the energy of the electron in the atom. In particular, that they involve changes in the energy of the electron within the atom. But there are only specific energy changes represented in the spectrum. The spectrum is not continuous, but is made up of sharp lines. The only way this can happen is if there are only certain energies that the electron can have in the atom. This is the idea behind Bohr's model and begins the quantization of the atom. Bohr suggested that the structure of the atom had electrons orbiting the nucleus at fixed distances and therefore energies, like the solar system. Using this idea and fundamental constants plus the radius of the hydrogen atom. Bohr was able to reproduce Balmer's formula in general and predict the lines in the hydrogen spectrum. Both specific energies, which are required by the atomic line spectra, and the fixed distances, which allow Bohr to predict the spectrum of hydrogen, are critical in Bohr's model. The changes in energy seen in the spectrum resulted from electrons jumping from one orbit to another, absorbing energy if moving outward and releasing it if moving inward.